And uh, what do I hit to move the? Uh, just the large button on top. Is okay, great. Uh, great. Um, so I have to have to smile uh, at that introduction. It was great. Thank you very much. Uh, however, um, I have not formally ever worked for the Senate. The Senate is the upper body. I have worked for the House of Representatives, which is the lower body. Um, uh, uh, that is one way in which the Senate is closer to space. The other is that, that we it's usually referred to as the black hole of legislation. Uh, so. Uh, uh, but thank you, and, and uh, I have to say, as, as, as Rand did, uh, uh, I'm as sorry as Jeff did earlier this morning, just how wonderful this conference has been. I've actually had the opportunity to attend some of the panels and sessions, and it's just been the level of engagement and news and progress that's happening in this industry is just truly just inspiring, and it makes me want to go back to my hometown of D.C., um, uh, which is uh, 20 square miles surrounded by reality and uh, try to fight to help more of this stuff happen. Um, and the purpose of my talk today is very brief and simple. We all know that competition in the private sector is a good thing, but today I'm talking about that it's important to have competition inside government too. So, um, you know, some people say that competition is a necessary evil um, and the foundation, of course, has always talked about the importance of creating in space a free and competitive marketplace. We always add the word competitive. We never talk about just a free market because the free market's sort of laissez-faire. It's about government creating a business environment, a business paradigm where people with a good idea have the freedom to enter the market. That's critical. Market entry is critical in whichever commercial space activity you're talking about, um, and then pers to pursue a, uh, an economic return. Um, well, what about the public sector? A lot of politicians love to, you know, you know, scream about wasteful duplication of effort. Oh, the Defense Department does this, and NASA does it too. Well, they should share the same thing, and not, then we wouldn't be spending as much money, okay? Because we wouldn't, you know, be duplicating things. And NOAA does the same thing, and why do they do it differently? And these other people in the government do the, do the same thing, and they're doing it differently, and we should just have one system for everyone, and that will make things efficient and wonderful. Okay, um, but I would argue it's better to have an intelligence community in the Air Force and NOAA and NASA as four distinct buyers of what I will broadly call remote sensing spacecraft or data sets because then you have a four customer market instead of a one customer market that's a monopsony and monopsonies are just as bad as monopolies. It has sometimes been argued that what we need to do with space and civil and commercial space policy is strengthen the hand of our space agency. You know, obviously there's always talk about, let's give NASA more money, give NASA 1%, da, 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 okay? And I've heard, you know, Department of Space, the Department of Science and Technology, give the NASA administrator cabinet rank, you know, all those sorts of ideas that somehow if you combine together the space agencies or the R&D agencies, you create enough political mass, critical mass in, in Washington, D.C., in, in the political sense, that somehow they'll be able to get more money and they'll be uh, able to uh, have more influence over policy making, and then we'll, be, we'll get to go into space and do what we want to do in space, because they'll be more powerful, okay? Well, I'm going to give you an illustrative example of why that doesn't work or why the alternative is better than that. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, in my salad days, um, the Reagan administration um, pr promulgated two different national space policies as the sort of blueprint of policy for how uh, the United States government was going to pursue space activities writ large 
in whether it was national security, civil, commercial, whatever. In the broadest sense, all the space things that were being done by the federal government were contained in these policy documents. In 1982, the policy document was authored by primarily by the National Security Council uh, in the White House, uh, along with OSTP and OMB, and NASA, and the Department of Defense. There was no one else involved, because there was no one else to be involved. Those were the players. In 1988, there were new participants. The Secretary of Transportation provided a strong role, and the Secretary of Commerce provided a strong role, and a lot of input. And what changed between those two policies? The 1982 policy doesn't mention the word commercial. It's not in there. Now, Deke Slayton had just successfully launched a commercial launch vehicle from Matagorda Island a year after Gary Hudson's failed attempt, both for David Hanna of Space Services. A commercial company had proposed to offer a commercial remote sensing satellite to NOAA to provide data to, uh, for, for, and, and to disseminate commercial data to the growing number of users from Landsat. There were commercial companies talking about things, even in 1982. In 1983, Martin Marietta proposed commercially selling the Titan launch vehicle. So there were things going on, and, and, and Orbital Sciences, of course, developed, began their, um, um, yeah, the TOS, thank you, uh, uh, the transfer orbit stage started that effort commercially in, in 1980, when the company was founded. Um, but instead, you had NASA launching commercial communication satellites. NASA was in the commercial business itself, competing with the Europeans. The 1988 policy included extensive discussion of a new recognized sector in space, the commercial space sector, as well as a civil sector and national security space sector. And ever since then, every national space policy has reflected the architecture of 88, not 82. Ever since then, there's always been discussion of the role of the commercial space sector in US space policy. As examples of things that were in the policy or talked about or initiated back in 1988, this is 27 years ago. Some of you were not born, okay? Which makes me feel bad, but some of you were not born then, okay? A US policy first said that the US government shall encourage private investment in space short of direct subsidy, okay? It said that the US government agency shall not preclude or deter the commercial space sector in lots of different ways specifically with regards to transportation, with regards to remote sensing, with regards to nothing, but in general they said that as well. The government sector shall purchase commercially available space goods and services to the extent possible. A much ignored policy that has been in and out of policies ever since, but that was in 88. The NASA budget proposal actually in, in, the, in the early 88 included funding for purchase of commercial services from a commercially developed space facility, which had been proposed by Max Faget and Joe Allen at Space Industries, called the Industrial Space Facility, or ISF. And we just had a panel before lunch talking about commercial space facilities. The Reagan administration proposed that back in 88, okay? And NOAA announced that they started, buy, were gonna buy, they weren't going to use NASA to launch their satellites, their weather satellites or remote sensing satellites anymore. They were gonna buy commercial launches. Remember, DOD had their own ELVs that they were using to, you know, 
to start getting off of the shuttle, but they weren't buying them as commercial services. They were doing full, full price cost plus contracts. Noah said, we're gonna buy commercially just like any other customer. What we need are strong, vibrant policy competitors. The reason those ideas were talked about and championed in 88 is because you had the Department of Transportation and the Department of Commerce playing a strong role in the interagency community and, the, and in the national policy community, okay? That made a big deal, a big difference in terms of what was actually happening in Washington, that you had other agencies, little tiny agencies, 10 people, five people, but they were fast and fleet of foot, and they would often outmaneuver and out-argue NASA, okay, or DOD in important environments, either in the media or with Congress or whatever. That's really valuable for us as a community to have other players in the policy process fighting for approaches that favor the interests of developing a, a more capable space transportation industry in this country or generally uh, more capable commercial space activities uh, with using spacecraft and human spaceflight and other things, which is what commerce can do. That's great for us to have more people in the, in the fight advocating our positions even when some agencies, and I'm not picking, picking on NASA or, or the Air Force, but don't always necessarily agree. So unfortunately in 96, 88 was sort of the peak year. In 96, they moved the Office of Commercial Space Transportation from DOT into the FAA. And whereas tonight we're gonna give an award to Bob Brumley, who was the general counsel of the Department of Commerce and led their efforts in the, in the 80s. You know, after he left, eventually they moved, uh, in like 93, they moved that office from the office of the secretary first to the National Institute of Standards and Technology and then to NOAA. And when the Land Remote Sensing Act was passed in 92, they put the office that regulates land remote sensing into NOAA. It's actually buried inside the National Environmental uh, Satellite Data and Information Systems Agency, or NESDIS, which is also the agency that would buy commercial remote sensing data or commercial weather data if the government were going to buy the data, which would be like NASA licensing commercial launch companies. Is there a conflict of interest there? But that's where we are right now in commercial remote sensing. 20 years later, we need to strengthen the role of these other agencies. And when we talk about trying to get a full billion dollars for commercial crew, these organizations, their budgets are half a million or three quarters of a million or a million dollars, or in the case of AST, even only 17 or 18 million dollars. It's chump change to get other organizations in government funded to enable and promote and advocate for and provide streamlined regulation of our industry. And we, but we don't think about them because they're hidden. No one knows they're there. We don't talk about them. Oh, well, that commerce office isn't really powerful, so we'll forget about them. Well, guess what? We forget about them and they weaken and they atrophy and they're not there fighting for the right ideas for us. That's our fault, that's on us, that's not on them, that's not on the government. We had an opportunity, we had a strong champion and we didn't help them. So 20 years later, we need to strengthen them, we need to help rebuild the Department of Commerce's role in part out of respect to all the great work that Bob, Bob Brumley did back in the 80s and have them help lead good multi-sector space policy making so that we can open the space frontier. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, so our last panel of New Space 2015, uh, can I have the panelists come on up uh, as I introduce it? Um, 
For this one, we, we wanted to talk about uh, not just what risks and what opportunities are currently in the marketplace, but also how they're uh, affecting the market and how companies are adapting to them. Uh, so to moderate this panel, we have uh, John Buher, 